It's a little like Animal Crossing with the MMO of Palea. You can play it on PvP servers and make it more like Rust, or join the PvE servers for a cozy experience. Meet Long Venter, a super cute multiplayer open world survival game you can buy on Steam for less than 20 bucks. Claim a plot of land, build your tent into a grand house, explore for flowers, fish, and wildlife, search for loot to sell, hoard, or trade with other players, buy items from vending machines and player-run shops, raid bunkers alone or with friends, ride boats and animals, craft and customize furniture, and grow plants to use in recipes or as decor. There's even in-game chat and waving to reveal your player name. I've been playing Long Vinter for two years and am dumbfounded why it's insanely popular in Korea but hasn't caught on in the US like Palea and Animal Crossing, which are quite similar. Long Vinter recently had a server wipe and many content rich updates since I last played, so I jumped back into the game and will share how I went from this to this in 20 hours. The journey began with the option to customize and clothe my character with a few simple backpack, skin tone, hair, and outfit choices. There's also a cosmetic shop where you can buy items with coins purchased or earned through playing. I was then presented with server selections. Currently, there are three servers in my country, a PvP server with a monthly reset or wipe, a regular PvP server, and a PvE server. This is what I chose since I didn't want to worry about other players capping me with a shoddy and stealing my precious loot. I packed my bags and boarded a ship bound for the Long Vinter Archipelago. After a treacherous journey, I found myself beached at Mrs. Snow's outpost. All outposts have names if you look in the vending machines. I had enough to buy a fishing pole but was otherwise broke, homeless, and hungry, so I set off in search of shelter and resources. It wasn't long until I spied evidence of civilization and met my first islander by the name of Kojo Nut, who taught me it's customary to wave, share your name, and spin in place to indicate that you're friendly. Much to my surprise, Kojo recognized me from my homeland of YouTube and wished me well during my stay on their island. After a bit of aimless exploring, I wandered towards Sergeant Lake Outpost to purchase a tent and ran into Kojona again, as well as a new villager with a mysterious beard and equally ambiguous name of Star. He didn't say much and I got the impression that if we were on the PvP server, he'd probably shank me as I turned my back and then steal my loot. So I bought my tent and booked it straight to the adjacent island to stake a claim and my tent on what would become my new Long Vinter home. I installed the stove I found while dumpster diving, but still needed a workbench and chainsaw. So I set off towards the glory hole, otherwise known as the pond with whitefish. Word is this is the best fishing ground for newbies as whitefish fetch a pretty penny. So I loaded up and then decided to do a bit of looting on my way to the fish market. Suddenly, I realized I messed up, as there was Mr. Mysterious Starbeard. He stared at me and I at him as I pondered the impressive odds of ending up in a soundproof building in the middle of the Arctic with the one cannibal on the entire map. Nervously, I conjured a bit of chit chat as I plotted my escape. Seen a workbench? I shakily uttered. He replied with a gruff, no, and then proceeded to follow me. I hit the door and bolted off like a prom dress, finally reaching the safety of a healing fire and what looked like a welcome sign, but it turned out to be a sign that I had the great misfortune of being stranded on a land full of cannibals and cultists. Could this be the reason for the low player count on the US PVE server? After doubling back to shake Mr. Starbeard and his cult friends off my trail, I reached the safety of my tent, deposited my loot treasures, and found an outpost to offload my fish. Before upgrading my tent, I decided to do a bit of exploring for means of escaping. I caught a glimpse of what looked like a rowboat on the horizon. But after an exhausting swim in frigid waters, I realized it was trickery and that the boat was merely there to offer false hope of escape. Well, after a cold, lonely night in the woods, surviving on hallucinogenic berries, I spied a mirage of a house with Hansel and Gretel vibes. Lo and behold, it was a real house where Kojo Nut lived. 
I made mental note of a potential safe haven, assuming Kojo wasn't a cannibal or a cultist, and hopefully was indeed a true YouTube connoisseur who would see the value in keeping me alive. Upon checking my map, I realized Kojo's house was near an airdrop location. I didn't know what to expect, but was hopeful for a miracle to rain upon me that would help me to survive until I could be rescued. I waited and waited and finally heard the drop land with what would be the mother load of goodies. The first box contained the holy grail of long winter sacks, the hiking backpack, which expanded my inventory and sells for about 30k on the black market. The second crate gifted me a shiny new AR that looked bad enough to scare Mr. Starbeard and his posse. I began to think that maybe I stood a chance. So I decided to explore a bit more. I discovered a giant golf ball with a modest loot collection and a suspiciously oversized collection of solar panels. There was an opening in the fence, but I decided that my curiosity was not worth finding out what horrifying piece of technology they were powering. So I made my way to the recycler to pawn my unwanted loot and then returned to my tent. My hard work and evasion had paid off as I was alive and I had enough money to buy a workbench and begin my house upgrade quest. Since this was my first home, I had to select the cabin option for now, but can later build a store, windmill, or a mining rig. For the next half hour, I used my chainsaw to clear cut the island and finally chopped enough wood to erect a full blown cabin of my own. And as I was in the middle of creating a door code that Starbeard the cannibal couldn't hack, a new airdrop alert sounded. So I quickly completed the upgrade, took a minute to appreciate my new home with its anti-cannibal security, and then headed towards the airdrop with visions of more hiking backpacks dancing in my head as I sat chilling my buns in the snow. I got majorly hosed with this drop, acquiring some meager gun building components and a fish trap. If luck wasn't on my side, I knew I'd have to score the majority of my loot the hard way with some good old fashioned dumpster diving at the recycling facilities. After a couple hours, I had so many goodies that I needed to buy containers for organizing the tools, cooking ingredients, fishing, and hunting supplies. I had looted and chopped my way to middle class and was ready to upgrade my house to a second story when another airdrop alert popped up. And after admiring my gorgeous house, I figured it would be a good time to take my little dinghy for its inaugural trip in the frigid long winter waters. And this, my friends, was a very unfortunate decision. Oh, the dinghy worked just fine and made the trip up north without issue, and I found the airdrop all right. But what I didn't know is that Long Vinter had added wandering NPC looters who are armed. I saw what looked like a Mr. Starbeard cult member approaching with Ernest, so I cautiously backed off and mistakenly drew my weapon as a warning. And this is where the crap hit the fan. He whipped out his cannibal hunting rifle, so I quickly retreated, but my greed over seeing him paw through my loot got the better of me, and I made a split-second decision to capitalize on shooting him in the back. It turns out the NPCs not only engage if engaged upon, but also have pretty darn good aim and a fast firing rate. So I perished. NPC dude and Starbeard feasted upon my juicy tenderloins. Eat me. But alas, I could respawn? What in the Jumanji is going on here? I was horrified by the thought of never being free of Long Vinter, but was even more distraught over my coveted, supersized backpack being gone forever. Not the buttons! Not my gumdrop button! Overflowing with adrenaline and lacking better judgment, I filled my tiny pockets with food, a rusty old AR, and my backup inflatable dinghy I had stowed for just such an occasion and set out for revenge. And hopefully, my bullet-torn backpack. This time, I spared no expense and booked a private fishing trolley to take me to the outpost nearest the airdrop murderer in the frozen north. Upon arrival, I flopped my dinghy in the sea and paddled feverishly until I arrived at the murder scene. It was a good sign that my other dinghy was still there. Maybe I didn't lose my other items either. As I wandered closer to the airdrop, my stomach sank. 
Not only had my hiking backpack, GPS, gun, and map vanished, but that Neanderthal had also picked the airdrop clean. There was nothing left. Like any good woman, I chose to drown my sorrows with a bit of retail therapy at Kyrie's Equipment and then toured my island HGTV style, marveling at the curb appeal of some of my neighbor's homes, and then sadly wandered back to my fixer-upper. But not until after a quick spa treatment in someone's sauna. Don't worry, I sat on a towel. I figured the least I could do for using their sauna was to buy a gently used fire pit from their vending machine, and it looked spectacular as my new lawn ornament. Armed with my newfound ability to respawn, I ventured to nearby islands to see what other treasures I could buy. This guy's vending machine was loaded with the most insane riches and lavish desired items. Whose house is this? No, God, please, no! I'm living a nightmare. I am living a nightmare. I kept repeating as I barreled for home. And then I came upon a sad little backpack boy with a glazed expression that said that he too had just realized he was stuck in Jumanji and that his weakness was cake. Cake is my weakness. I feel your pain, little buddy. I love cake too. The next few hours were filled with more airdrops. Yes, I realize I have a problem. Reindeer chasing, because I forgot my hunting rifle, looting chests at the arena, collecting turkey feathers for my hunting compendium, and, well, selling them for a small fortune. I also caught enough fish to gain access to the gated lake, custom painted some furniture, including a sauna I found at the arena, and no, I didn't use a towel. And then I took the wolf collar I found to the shop, only to discover I had to finish my plant compendium before I'd be awarded a wolf mount. So this became my new quest. I paddled to a peacock-infested island nestled deep in the southwest to procure the cabbage and then sprouted my own coffee beans from seed, which finally completed my plant collection. So I headed back to the farming shop. I had four gallant wolf steeds at my disposal and I traded my collar for the noble gray wolf. The two of us would never be separated, unless of course I met Starbeard and his cronies, and we rode off into the sunset together. Okay, so we took the boat. I mean, when was the last time you saw a wolf swim? With my quest for a wolf whip complete and my house slowly being upgraded, I did some more looting and shooting, fishing to complete my collection, and airdrop hunting to feed my addiction. I really need to learn my lesson because they're not worth it. I returned to the gated lake and caught the elusive swordfish, which completed my fish compendium and unlocked access to the fishing NPC. Don't worry, he's unarmed, I checked. And I was able to buy the weather station, which makes you money. Don't question it, it just does. I excitedly galloped home with my weather station, placed it on my property, and then realized that I needed to craft solar panels to power it and the sprinkler that I bought from the farming shop. So I turned to my trusty crafting manual, which showed I needed more solar kits and sheet metal to make solar panels. And to make sheet metal, I needed iron ingot, which comes from the iron ore in the caves. So let's go spelunking. I forked over 800 smackaroos for a boat ride to the cave, used my pickaxe to chisel iron chunks. I also found some emerald, which I think is quite valuable. And then I happened upon a gated area with loot chests and seemingly guarded by a laser. I decided to cut my losses and head back with a pocket full of ore and my life. I bought a smelter from the NPC, filled it with coal and iron ore, and waited for my precious ingot to be crafted. To waste a bit of time, I stalked the loot arena and met a new friend, scored a sweet new hiking backpack when she left, chased some more reindeer, and finally caught one. Don't worry, they respawn. By this time, my ingot was finished and I crafted a solar panel and I was able to collect money from my functioning weather station. I was still a bit strapped for cash, so I waited and waited and waited and then took my dough on a trip to the casino, which is located in the lighthouse and is only reachable by charter boat. The lighthouse area is actually pretty cool with a bait shop and multiple levels with a basement of loot, a vendor, a casino where you can bet with friends or the house, and then a boss area at the top, 
which I gained access to thanks to a special card I yoinked from an airdrop. So sometimes they do pay off. This time I was smart enough to leave my hiking backpack safely at home and I packed some decent heat with the SMG I crafted and eventually I beat the casino boss, earning me a tiny monetary prize of 77 coins and a high access card for use in other bunkers. I returned home and reflected upon the 20 hours I had spent in Long Winter. I survived Starbeard and his cannibal cultist friends, looted and crafted my way to an amazing base that had so many upgrades to go, completed my plant and fish collections, adopted a wolf pal, and was astonished at how much Long Winter has improved over the years. With how fun the looting and base building is in this game, and the choice of PvP or PvE servers, it still boggles my mind why Long Winter remains a hidden gem.